As you can tell by my distinct lack of an Australian accent, I am not our president and CEO, Matt Naylor, uh, but I am Laura Boder, Curator of Education, and it is my absolute pleasure to welcome you all here on this windy and uh, a little bit rainy evening. Uh, I do want to let you know, if you are in the back, and so those last two rows or so, um, it will get a little cooler back there because that's our air handler, as you all know. Uh, we are underground. We're actually several stories underground at this place, making it one of the safest, most comfortable, uh, comfortable places to be. But if you're back in those back two rows and it starts to get a little chilly, just walk down the stairs uh, to some of these other chairs and you will be more comfortable. So just take that into consideration. If you stand up and walk down right now, I, uh, I welcome that movement. Again, it's uh, my pleasure to welcome you all here to the second program in our five-part speaker series offered in conjunction with the exhibition Discovery and Recovery, Preserving Iraqi Jewish Heritage, which is on display, I know many of you went this evening, at the National Archives, and it runs through August 15th. Kansas City is truly honored to be the first of only four cities that were invited to host this traveling version of the exhibit. We're also delighted to be partnering on this speaker series with the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education and the National Archives at Kansas City. Uh, as we did last year for State of Deception, the Power of Nazi Propaganda, and it's wonderful to see so many familiar faces in this audience. We are so glad to have you back this summer. Now, if you haven't seen the exhibition yet, I really encourage you to do so. It is fantastic. Uh, Tuesday through Saturday from 8 to 4 is when the exhibition is open, but if you're coming for any of the other portions of our speaker series, NARA is open until 6.30, so you can check it out at that point. Now there are also some flyers outside, and feel free to grab one of those. Our next uh, speaker is actually going to be July 15th, uh, that's made featuring KU graduate Corinne Wagner. She is the Cultural Heritage Preservation Specialist for the Smithsonian Institution, who supervised the preservation and the freezing of the water-damaged collections known as the Iraqi Jewish Archive. You'll notice on the ends of either of these stairs, there are some microphones that are set up. And though I don't normally do the introduction, I generally do that question and answer period. Uh, it is a pleasure to host our speaker this evening, and I anticipate that there will be some wonderful questions. So please remember, come down those stairs during that question and answer time. We invite you to use the microphones. That allows us uh, to capture that on the camera. Uh, that is right back there in the back, and to catch that question, also to be sure that everyone in the auditorium hears it. Lastly, we're extremely grateful for the generosity of many trusts and foundations that have made this project possible. Please take a moment. You all have evaluation sheets. Read their names. They are listed there. If you don't have an evaluation sheet, just raise your hand and one of our volunteers will bring you one. Thank you very much. And we deeply appreciate if you complete that survey and turn it in before leaving tonight. We value your feedback. It is priceless. And uh, it is something that we use to continue this great programming. Now it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Joyce Hess, who is the newly elected president of the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education, and will be introducing our speaker this evening. Good evening. We are privileged to have with us tonight Dr. Mark R. Cohen, the Kadori A. Zilka Pro Professor of Jewish Civilization in the Near East Emeritus and Professor of the Near Eastern Studies Emeritus at Princeton University. Specializing in Jews in the Arab world and a leading scholar on the history of Jews in the Middle Ages under Islam, he was honored as the first winner of the Gold Seer Prize awarded by Merrimack College for the scholarship promoting better understanding between Jews and Muslims. Dr. Cohen earned his undergraduate degree at Brandeis, studying European and American history and Jewish studies, his master's degree at Columbia University, and his doctorate at the Jewish Theological Seminary. Among his many authored books, Under Crescent and Cross, The Jewish in the Middle Ages, 
published in 2008, represents a comparative study of Islamic Jewish and Christian Jewish relations in the Middle Ages. Described as a classic, it's been translated in nine languages, Arabic, Turkish, Hebrew, French, German, Romanian, Czech, Russian, and Spanish, and thank goodness English. During his tenure at Princeton, Dr. Cohen taught courses in medieval history, as well as graduate seminars dealing either in Near Eastern Jewish or Judeo-Arabic and Genesis documents. One of his students, Dr. Ori Bashkin, our feature speaker last week, who described him as brilliant and one of the nicest people she knows. In his retirement, Dr. Cohen has been a visiting professor at Columbia University, New York University, and New York University in Abu Dhabi. Recently, he presented lectures on the Cairo Geniza at King Saud University in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Mark Cohen to Kansas City. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, first time ever in this part of the country, and I've enjoyed uh, my visits to this museum and to the archives earlier today. Uh, I think that there may be a bit of overlap between what I have to say tonight and what Marit said last week, and uh, yeah, I hope that those of you who were here there will uh, find it reinforcing. Now, I'm calling this lecture History and Memory of the Jews of Iraq. History is an approximation of what happened in the past, arrived at by scholarly methods and through an examination of all available sources. Memory, particularly collective memory, is what people choose to recall from the past based on what is salient and important in the present, while forgetting those things that conflict with what they choose to remember. Now, most reputable historians today would agree, despite vociferous demure in Islamophobic circles, that especially compared to the experience of Jews in Europe and their Holocaust tragedy in the 20th century, Jews lived relatively securely in the lands of Islam during the Middle Ages and even in later times. It was certainly not an interfaith utopia because the Jews, along with the Christians, were subject to humiliating legal and social disabilities, including an annual poll tax. <clears throat> but theoretically, and in large part, actually, they were protected subjects called Vimmies in Arabic, enjoying freedom of religion, and movement and benefiting from untrammeled economic opportunity in the medieval period. Arabic language and ideas penetrated deeply into the fabric of Judaism and Jews shared substantially in Arabic Islamic culture so that in these matters we can truly speak of a golden age. During those centuries from the rise of Islam to the, in the 7th century to the 12th century, or the 13th, persecutions were few and far between, and they were almost always directed at non-Muslims as a class, not at Jews per se. These disruptions typically occurred when non-Muslims were perceived to have violated the restrictive ordinances of the so-called Pact of Umar, ignoring the inferior status assigned to them by Islamic law and religion. Anti-Semitism, understood properly as an irrational belief in a malevolent, violent, anti-social Jewish alliance with satanic forces seeking to control the world, which we can trace in Europe from about the 12th century, simply did not exist in the lands of Islam. Jews were more severely oppressed in later Islamic centuries, though the level of oppression is often generalized to the point of exaggeration. 
It differed in intensity and in form from place to place and from circumstance to circumstance and had much to do with general decline in the Muslim world after the 12th century, a setback that naturally affected the minorities to a greater extent than the Muslim majority. There was, moreover, a period of substantial remission and revival during the heyday of Ottoman imperial expansion in the Middle East and North Africa in the 16th century, which coincided with the influx of highly educated and skilled Sephardic Jews expelled from Catholic Spain in 1492. Furthermore, the modern period saw significant ameliora amelioration for at least the more well-to-do Jews in many Islamic countries. Nonetheless, in many places in the later Middle Ages, until and including the early modern period, large numbers of Jews lived in abject poverty and squalid conditions, especially where, after the middle of the 15th century, they were cramped into exclusively Jewish neighborhoods called Mela in Morocco and Har elsewhere, and sometimes referred to somewhat uh, incorrectly as ghettos by European travelers. And they suffered discrimination and sometimes even violence, though the upper crust of the well-to-do Jews did not experience the um, openly, they, they did not experience the bias in the same way and found means to participate openly in Muslim society uh, or as political or economic agents of the European powers. As is often reiterated, the Dhimma system, the policy of protection, cum subordination, introduced in the early Islamic centuries continued in force for all Jews in the Islamic world until pressure from organizations, particularly European organizations, Western colonial powers, uh, seeking to improve Jewish life in the Muslim world, uh, led to the abolition of this status in the Ottoman Empire in the 19th century, and in Morocco, which was not part of the Ottoman Empire, at the beginning of the 20th century. In Yemen, which was less subject to these outside European pressures, the Dhimma system remained in effect until the mass migration and exodus of Yemeni Jews to Israel in 1949 and 1950. The colonial period in the 19th century was particularly challenging for Jews as many of them embraced modernization, Western education and extraterritorial protection in order to escape from their disadvantaged position. This, however, drove a wedge between Europeanizing Arab Jews, on the one hand, and Muslims who rejo rejected colonialism and pursued their own nationalist goals, on the other. The extent to which colonialist powers, po policies, excuse me, or less formally, European interference in Middle Eastern affairs alongside the dismantling of the traditional protective Vima system helped destabilize Jewish-Muslim coexistence in modern times has not been fully appreciated. Jewish-Muslim conflict was compounded by the arrival in the 19th century of Christian anti-Semitism in the hands of European missionaries, missionaries and other colonizers, providing fodder for growing Arab anti-Jewish hostility, especially following the rise of political Zionism, the British Balfour Declaration of 1917, and the growth of Jewish settlement in Palestine uh, at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th centuries, leading finally to the establishment of the State of Israel. The Iraqi Jews, on whom I will focus the rest of my lecture, were truly indigenous people. Most of them 
tracing their ancestry back to the Babylonian exile in the sixth century before the Common Era, a dozen centuries before the Islamic conquests, and two and a half millennia before the 20th century. The Iraqi perspective on the past more authentically reflects the long-term experience of Jews in the Middle East and henceforth their memory of their own history under Islamic rule in the light of their 20th century experience is especially relevant to my subject. Now, for several decades following the replacement of the Ottomans by British mandatory rule in 1922, after the Turkish defeat in World War I, the Jews of Iraq, at least the middle class, enjoyed substantial comfort and prosperity, experiencing generally good relations with Muslim friends and business associates. Jews held important and influential positions in the government, and Jewish intellectuals, writers, and journalists were well integrated into the general cultural scene. Then, the walls of Jewish-Muslim coexistence seemed suddenly to come crashing down on June 1st and 2nd, 1941, the Jews of Baghdad were traumatized by a pogrom called in Arabic the Farhud, a word which means violent dispossession and connoting the breakdown of law and order where life and property are in peril. As many as 180 people perished and many hundreds more were injured, some brutally, and much Jewish property was plundered or destroy. The violence erupted during a power vacuum following the British overthrow of the nationalist pro-Nazi coup against the monarchy led by Rashid Ali Ali Al Kilani and his henchmen, among whom was the pro-Nazi Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, Haj Amin al Husseini, who was living in exile from Palestine at the time. The British had uh, expelled him after uh, the failure of the Arab revolt of 1936 and 1939, which he had uh, himself taken part in its leadership. For the two months, the two months that the al Khilani government was in power, the rebel regime spewed anti-Semitic propaganda that terrified the Jewish community. Then at the end of May, at a particularly gloomy moment for the European allies in their prosecution of the war effort against Germany and Italy, and fearful of Nazi influence in Iraq and the potential threat to ready access to Middle Eastern oil, British forces attacked and defeated the army of the rebellion and prepared to reinstate the legitimate regime headed by the child king and his uncle, the regent, whose name was Abdullah. Rashid al Khalani and his henchmen fled to Iran, leaving behind this power vacuum. The violence against the Jews took place during the short period of anarchy that followed on June 1st and 2nd, which happened to coincide with the two days of the Jewish Shavuot holiday, giving the Jews an opportunity to combine celebration of the holiday with rejoicing at the fall of the anti-Semitic regime and the restoration of British-backed rule. Tragically and inexplic inexplicably, the British force encamped outside the city stood down and failed to step in to nip the violence in the bud, and the results perpetrated by disgruntled, routed soldiers of the rebel regime, an amorphous mob of local Baghdadi Muslims, and Bedouin plumbers from outside the city were disastrous. The exact details 
of the British failure to protect the Jews, and in particular, the uninspiring role played by the British ambassador to Iraq, Sir Kinahan Cornwallis, in delaying British intervention have been much discussed by historians. Some see British inaction as bearing considerable responsibility for the damage that was done. To their credit, many Muslims protected their Jewish neighbors even to the point, even to the point of actively fighting off the marauders. In the immediate aftermath of the Farhud, things largely returned to normal. A small minority of mainly young Iraqi Jews formed the militant Zionist movement to defend Iraqi Jewry against any possible repetition of the violence, and of course to propagate the idea of emigrating illegally to Palestine. Most Iraqi Jews, however, remained staunchly anti-Zionist and loyal to Iraq, where, despite Nazi meddling, a Jewish problem like the one that gave rise to Zionism in Europe simply did not exist. With the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948 and the humiliating defeat of the Iraqi expeditionary force sent to fight along other, alongside other Arab armies against the nation, nascent Jewish state, anti-Jewish se sentiment in Iraq heated up. In 1950, the Iraqi government decided to rid itself of at least the Jewish troublemakers by permitting them to emigrate to Israel, subject to surrendering their Iraqi citizenship. Surprisingly, given the pro-Iraqi and anti-Zionist stance of the majority of Iraqi Jews, some 120,000 of them, nearly the entire community, took the deal and left for Israel on planes provided by Israel in a deal struck with the Iraqi government. The spirited efforts of Israeli agents sent secretly to Iraq to encourage emigration, plus the explosion of a bomb placed in a Jewish synagogue by perpetrators unknown to this day are two of the principal factors that precipitated this surprising exile from exile as a literary scholar has aptly named the mass departure. The result was that nearly, as I said, the entire Jewish community, not only of Baghdad, but of Iraq, found themselves living in the new Jewish state. How did the Jews explain the Farhud? Did they link the tragic event of June 1st to 2nd, 1941, to an age-old anti-Jewish hatred and violence? How does their collective historical memory compare to that of Ashkenazi Jews who link the experience of the Holocaust with an age-old Jew hatred and persecution at the hands of Christians? Let's first examine for a moment the better known Ashkenazi collective memory. Beginning in the Middle Ages, the Jews of Europe produced a huge literature memorializing their suffering and martyrdom at the hands of Christians and Christianity. Famously, the historian Salo Baron called this, and these are his words, the lachrymose interpretation of Jewish history. The collective historical memory of Christian hatred that persecution was reinforced every time a Jew or a Jewish community stood accused of some misdeed, such as the infamous blood libel, and was punished usually severely, often without judicial due process. 
the lachrymose Ashkenazi collective historical memory was strengthened every time Jews were forced to convert to Christianity, every time the right of freedom of religion was undermined, Jews recalled prior persecutions every time a Jewish community was expelled from its European homeland. After the pogroms of 1391 in Catholic Spain and the expulsion of 1492, Sephardic Jewry developed its own lacrimose collective memory. This European Jewish collective memory of persecution was reinforced in the 20th century during the Nazi era when anti-Semitism became an instrument of the evil and destructive policy of the Nazi party and after Hitler came to power in 1933 of the German government. Uncountable tomes of books, memoirs, and histories, oral histories, and films about the Holocaust, along with museums and memorials around the world, as well as a proliferation of university and adult education courses on the Holocaust have perpetuated the Ashkenazi collective memory of suffering and turned the Holocaust into perhaps the most pervasive reality of Jewish identity today, both in the diaspora and in Israel. Now, uh, what can we say about the historical memory of Iraqi Arab Jews who suffered the Farhud and later left their homeland under duress in the middle years of the 20th century. Did they profess a long-term, lachrymose historical memory of suffering related to this experience? In particular, how did they portray the Farhud? Fortunately, we have a sizable number of memoirs by Iraqi Jews in English, French, Hebrew, and Arabic, all of which describe the pogrom. Was their recall of the past, like that of the Ashkenazi, based on some factual foundation of historical persecution or not? Now, some scholars today point to what they call the, I quote them, the Holocaust experience of Jews from Arab lands. This trend is especially evident with regard to those Jews from Iraq and other places who describe the Farhud as a Middle Eastern chapter of the Nazi extermination of Jews in Europe. Yad Vashem, the National Holocaust Museum in Israel, archives documents relevant to episodes of persecution in Islamic lands, including quite prominently the Farhud. These are accompanied by the grisly story of the internment of Jews in North Africa in regional forced labor camps during the Vichy French, Italo-Fascist, and German Nazi occupation. The stories include tragic accounts of the deportation of Jews from Libya to concentration camps in Nazi-occupied Europe during the Second World War. The theme of protracted persecution of Jews in Islamic lands, which some, like Orit Bashkin in her book, calls, and this is her word, the Farhudization of Oriental Jewish history, represents an effort to adopt an Ashkenazi-like collective historical memory. An example is an Israeli documentary film about the pogrom in Baghdad in 1941, produced by the Babylonian Jewry Heritage Center in Israel and televised in Israel in the year 2008. In interviews with eyewitnesses and period footage of Baghdad, though not of the actual atrocities, there are, is no footage of the actual atrocities, it suggests, this film suggests, comparison with anti-Semitic pogroms in Europe. The historical narrative of the film is basically accurate. 
But if it was meant to suggest centuries of suffering at the hands of Muslims, no one who was interviewed implied that the pogrom was a link in a long chain of Islamic persecution. In a typical sentiment, one interviewee states, quote, the Farhud put an end to the illusion of the Jews of Iraq that we could live comfortably in the surrounding society among Iraqis. So for him, the Farhud is the beginning of a period of persecution, not the end of centuries of persecution. The Iraqi, Iraqi Israeli writer Eli Amir's novelesque memoir, Dove Flyer, recently made into a feature length film in Israel, preserves a, a distinction between the Holocaust and the Farhud. The following exchange takes place uh, after the brutal hanging in Basra of the wealthy Jew Shafiq Adas on charges of providing material support for Israel during its War of Independence, the event with which this book actually begins. The protagonist writer's father, imbued with the Zionist solution, argues with the Dove Flyer, named Abu Edward, about the role that Zionism in Israel has played in recent anti-Jewish violence in Baghdad. Have you forgotten the Farhud? asked my father. Hundreds of dead, thousands injured. Is that not, not is that nothing to you? Abu Edward, who staunchly rejects Zionism, answers, quote, if a Jew didn't forget, he couldn't live. For heaven's sake, the Christians killed six million. If the Muslims slaughtered a few of us too, that's no more than they do to each other every day. Ashkenazi historical memory and assumptions about the fate awaiting Iraqi Jews played a role in motivating the Israeli effort to extract them from their country shortly after the foundation of Israel. In his memoirs, Mordechai ben Porat recounts conversations at the highest level in Israel leading up to the famous Operation Ezra and Nehemiah in 1950. 1951, as the rescue operation was named. Fearing for the lives of the Jews, especially in the aftermath of the Farhud, the Israeli political leadership from Ben-Gurion down, all of them Ashkenazim, expressed worry about another impending Holocaust on Arab soil. Imposing an Ashkenazi historical conception on the Iraqi situation, they decided to dispatch emissaries in late 1949 with native-born Iraqi Ben Parat himself at their helm in order to rescue the Iraqi Jews before this Holocaust could happen. Remarkably, however, none of the memoirs who wrote these memoirs, who witnessed the fierce firestorm of the Farhud and underwent the wrenching experience of permanent dislocation from their Iraqi homeland a decade later, none of them express a historical memory of persecution and anti-Semitism. They do not connect that immediate trauma with a lachrymose history of persecution from time immemorial. Seeking an explanation for the Farhud, they look not to anti-Semitism, not to a long history of persecution under Muslim rule, but to the complexities of contemporary political events following the deposal of Rashid Ali and to the role played by British complacency. In his memoir, the Iraqi journalist and historian Nisim Rajwan explains the Farhud in a section entitled What Actually Happened? Here is what he says. What actually happened on that fateful day in 1941 is now fairly well known and documented. But the chain of events that had led to it, the motives and blunders, the machinations, the failures, and the foibles that made the event possible and probably inevitable are not and will perhaps never become conclusively clear. Baghdad had fallen to the British, and the government of Rashid Ali was put to flight. 
Yet the British troops did not enter the city, and the results were disastrous for the Jews and greatly embarrassing both to Britain and to the pro-British regime that succeeded the rebel government. The Farouk occupies a chapter in the memoirs of Babri Fatah, who grew up in the poor neighborhood of Tatran and Baghdad and was not a member of the Jewish elite. His uncle was kidnapped by a mob and was never heard of again. The family assumed he was killed, but in spite of this very personal experience of Muslim violence in the Farhud, Fatah's effort to explain the events are entirely local and contemporary, relating to the fall of the pro-Nazi al Kilani government. There is no intimation of a role for anti-Semitism, no allusion to Arab or Muslim persecution as a systemic phenomenon rooted in the past. In his memoir, Adieu Baghdad, translated into English as Farewell Baghdad, Naim Qatar, an Iraqi Jewish writer living in Canada, makes the Farhud the very starting point of his memoir. But in his portrayal, the pogrom was a new phenomenon, not the result of deeply rooted Jew hatred. Coming at the beginning of a critical change in Jewish-Muslim relations, it affected him all the more, accustomed as he was to keeping friendly company with Muslim poets and other writers. His words, however, eschew a lachrymose Jewish collective memory of Islamic persecution and recall a very positive memory of Jewish life in Iraq before the pogrom. He writes, for centuries, we had taken pride in living on good terms with the Muslims. Then, in just one night, 13 centuries of shared life and neighborliness crumbled like a structure of mud and sand. As the memoirists testify, the positive characterization of Jewish-Muslim relations of belonging to Iraqi society is part of Iraqi Jewish memory of deep roots in their region. Salman Darwish, a physician in the Iraqi army during the period of the coup, puts it this way with some hyperbole in his Arabic memoir, which he called All Quiet on the Infirmary. In the infirmary, he writes, the Jews lived with their Muslim brothers in Iraq for more than 2,000 years in complete security and tranquility, adopting most of their customs, speaking their language, reading their philosophy, poetry, and ballet in classical Arabic, and did not use Arabic for speaking or for reading the Torah and the prayers alone. Now, to the people who felt such a profound rootedness in Iraq's Arab and pre-Arab past, the Farhud violence came as a rude shock. If, as they do, the memoirists see the pogrom of 1941 as the starting point of a gloomy history rather than as the latest link in a long historical chain of persecution, we may justifiably conclude that their perception was not divorced from historical experience. Many memoirists describe how life began to return to normal after the violence subsided. Doubtless, this can be attributed in part, at least, to the economic recovery resulting from the commercial boom during World War II. The immediate denazification of government propaganda also quieted fears. The return of the British also helped, but the memoirs suggest that it was also due to a widespread belief that what happened was an anomaly. Sasan Sameh, author of Baghdad Yesterday, The Making of an Arab Jew, was eight years old at the time of the Farhud. His well-to-do family was not directly affected by the violence. They lived in a neighborhood which the rioters never reached. He writes, the Farhud, in spite of its painful effects, was almost erased from the collective Jewish memory, though not, of course, 
from the memories of individuals and families who suffered per personally. Like many other writers, he speaks about Muslim neighbors who protected Jewish neighbors from the violence and literally stood between them and the rioters. Ali Amir writes in Dove Dove Flyer, uh, in a conversation about the actions of young Zionist activists as follows. The Muslims had always been good neighbors. They had looked after us and protected us. We had all drunk from the same well. And then, 10 years ago, along came the Farhud, the anti-Jewish riots, and nothing was quite the same again. But since daily life had gone back to a semblance of normality, why set up underground groups and run risks for a Jewish country far away, referring, of course, to Israel? Naim Khatan writes that the return of the British to Baghdad after the quelling of the Rashid Ali coup followed by his flight from the country and the punishment of some of the insurgents inspired a renewed sense of, uh, of confidence uh, amongst the Jews. If the shock of the Farhud dissipated, it was because it could not be correlated with a historical memory of Islamic persecution. The fact that many Muslims aided Jews seeking to protect them from the rampaging mobs must have reassured many that the Farhud was an exception proving the rule. Because it was followed by a renewed sense of security, the events of the late 40s, the mounting conflict between Jews and Arabs in Palestine, the hanging of Abbas in Basra for his allegedly aiding Israel, and finally, the laws of 1950 to 1951 leading to the mass exodus of most of Iraqi Jewry to Israel came as another unexpected shock. Now it might be argued against my point of view that 20th century Iraqi memoirists simply knew very little about their own history and were naively ignorant of centuries of persecution and Islamic anti-Semitism. In actual fact, at the time the memoirists wrote, the Jews of Iraq were not totally ignorant of the past. <coughs> Forty years after the period portrayed in Naim Khatan's book, Salman Darwish, the doctor whom I quoted before, traced the history of the Jews under Islam in the introductory chapters of his Arabic memoirs. His approach there is balanced. He describes periods of security, but is nonetheless careful to acknowledge periods of difficulty. Not surprisingly, his account features mainly the history of Jews in Iraq and other Eastern Islamic lands. Darwish does not generalize the occasional suffering of the Jews of Iraq in the past into a historical memory of persecution. He specifically emphasizes that the attacks on the Jews in June 1941 were not part of a long chain of persecution at Arab hands and were unlike the periodic persecutions of Ashkenazi Jews living in Christian Europe. He attributes this difference to the old Muslim obligation to protect Dhimis. Unlike Ashkenazi Jews and the descendants of 1492 Sephardi exiles from Spain, the Jews of Iraq had very few other sources in Arabic or Hebrew or commemorative rituals on the basis of which to construct and maintain a collective memory of persecution at the hands of Muslims. Sephardic prayer books typically lacked the medieval Ashkenazi liturgical poems called PUT, touching upon persecution and martyrdom in ancient and medieval times. Moreover, while the medieval ancestors of 20th century Arab Jews wrote thousands of poems imitating Arabic prosody and secular themes, only one such poem describing an episode of Muslim persecution is known. That poem, written by Abraham Ibn Ezra in the 12th century, memorializes the destruction or forced conversion of whole communities in North Africa and Spain by the fundamentalist Muslim Almohads 
in the middle of the 12th century, characteristic of a very different collective memory of Jewish relations with non-Jews, this poem only found a place in a Sephardic prayer book after the Catholic anti-Semitic pogroms in Reconquista, Spain in 1391, when it could be situated in the context of a harsher historical memory of Jewish relations with Christians. Muslim anti-Semitism has no place in the memoirs I have discussed. An anti-Semitic episode related by the memoirist Violet Shamash occurs characteristically in an anecdote about an exchange between a Jewish jeweler and a Christian customer. Dissatisfied with a flaw in the golden crucifix the Jew had made for her, the Christian woman cries out, as if it wasn't enough of you Jews to kill Jesus, now you've deformed his image. Had the ancestors, had the ancestors of 20th century Iraqi Jews known generations of centuries or and centuries of Islamic anti-Semitism and persecution, had the memoirists been bearers of a tradition of such suffering, and had they therefore considered the Farhud as part of a systemic long durée of Muslim anti-Jewish hatred and persecution, it is difficult to believe that they would have ignored that history when writing about the trauma of the 20th century. In conclusion, the memoirs of the Iraqi Jews who left their homeland in 1950 and 1951 or later, because some did remain for a few years, or memoirs written by their children about their parents' experience reveal no collective historical memory of suffering. We find no attempt to link either the Farhud or the Exodus in 1950-1951 to past persecution in Iraq or in any other Islamic land or to characterize the Farhud itself as an event within the framework of the Holocaust, a theme that has inappropriately intruded itself lately into contemporary Zionist historiography. The message of the memoir literature is clear, and if it differs from the dismal testimony of some Iraqi Jews living in Israel or elsewhere today, that can be explained, I suggest, in a number of ways. <coughs> For many, the memory of difficult times in Israel upon arrival in the country, the substandard transit the contrast between their middle-class comfort and high level of education in Iraq and the less fortunate circumstances in which they initially found themselves in Israel, the obstacles and prejudices they encountered in Israel upon arrival, and their slow climb from marginalization to integration in Israel and ultimately to success in Israeli society, all of this disposed some Iraqi Jews living in Israel to remember even harsher times in Iraq and to characterize the violent persecutions of the 1940s and 1950s as part of a larger systemic anti-Jewish phenomenon. Of course, for some, this works in the opposite way. And nostalgically, they remember happier times in their home countries in contrast to their suffering as new immigrants in Israel. Some may have felt the need to rationalize the sudden loss of their comfortable life in Iraq by blaming that loss on those traumatic events rather than on circumstances accompanying their difficult absorption into Israel. They may even call the Farhu our Shoah, or Baghdad's Kristallnacht, expressions I have read or heard in Israel. This construction, or better deconstruction, 
of the past comes close to the Ashkenazi historical memory of suffering, followed by redemption in the state of Israel. It helps Jews from Iraq and other Arab lands identify with the master narrative of Zionist history, an obvious attempt to compete with European Jews for a doleful historical memory and to claim a larger piece of the Zionist dream than the Ashkenazi founders of Israel and their descendants have traditionally granted them. In particular, Iraqi Jewish attempts to situate the Farhud within the context of Nazi persecution serves as a counter argument to the well-known Arab complaint that they had no part in the Holocaust and thus should not be made to pay the price for Christian and Nazi persecution of the Jews in Europe by accepting a Jewish state in their midst. Not surprisingly, many demonstrate their commitment, I mean many Jews from Arab lands, demonstrate their commitment and loyalty to Israeli society by taking a hard line on Israel's Arab foes and by calling attention to their mistreatment by Arab enemies in their countries of origin. For some, the historical claim of Arab persecution in Iraq more generally invoked with respect to Jews from all Arab countries supports the demand for restitution or related to that an argument about exchange of populations which offsets Arab demands for the right of return or failing that Israeli monetary compensation for the Palestinian refugees. The Israeli government keeps a tally of Jewish material losses to Arab expropriation in the lands of their immigration and plans to put these demands on the table to cancel out Palestinian demands for monetary compensation for losses attending the Nakba, the catastrophe as the Arab world calls their defeat by nascent Israel in 1948-49. Finally, many Iraqi and other Arab Jews wish to prove to the Ashkenazi founders of the State of Israel and their descendants that they too had a lachrymose history of suffering, climaxing at approximately the same time that the Holocaust was destroying European Jewry. The memoirists present a less tendentious point of view about their past. I would argue that the historical memory of coexistence between Jews and Muslims in Iraq that is inscribed in the vast majority of their written memoirs was both consistent with these Arab Jews' personal experience of decent relations with their Muslim neighbors in their own time and constructed on a substantially accurate recall of relations between Jews and Muslims in former times. That accounts for the fact that memory of these, that many of these memoirists saw the Farhud as shocking and violent as it was, as an exceptional episode in the long-term history of relatively peaceful interreligious relations in Iraq. It seems difficult to escape the conclusion, therefore, that the lachrymose counter-memory of Islamic persecution that is professed by many historians and by some Iraqi Jews living in Israel is an invention of the present. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And I invite you at this moment to uh, bring your questions down to either of the microphone stands at either end of the stairwells. I, uh, can you hear me now? Absolutely. Right? It's okay? Yes. 
I was born in Iraq, and we are talking about the same period, and I traveled to, went to Israel in 1950 after finishing high school, so I have a very good idea about that period. I want two things to stress out, the role of the Christians in Iraq. Both are minorities, but the Christian in general took the idea to show to the Muslims they hate the Jews more than the Muslim would hate. Uh, in Lebanon, for example, it was the first uh, translation uh, to Arabic of the protocol of the Zionist elder was done by a Christian. Just even lately when the Pope declared that the Jews are our elder brothers and we cannot blame the generation now, the wife of the past uh, president of Lebanon, he says, how could he do this? It was a really very, uh, when I was there, I had more suspicion about a Jewish so-called friend than an Arab friend, because they played the game. Uh, there's also in the, among the Palestinians, the the Christian Palestinian are the most vociferous anti-Israelis, and there's some anti-Jewish there. So that is a very, very sad, really, history about that part. Of course, the Christian are suffering now from the same thing that the Jews, but they should not have, they don't, uh, they didn't anticipate that. But the Jews are not there. There is nothing to trade sentiments with the Arabs. Uh, the other thing is that uh, the, uh, the, the, some of the Jews that left, the intellectuals ones, left to Israel were so shocked by the treatment and by the problems that when we went to Israel first, that some of them were very, very, became very anti-Zionist, anti-Israelis. And I, one of the, um, I don't know, maybe you know his name, became one of the most important, famous writer in Arabic as... Samir, Ma Samir Nakash. Uh, maybe, yeah. But he is considered to be the best writer in the Arab world in the language of Arab. So our contribution in Iraq was fantastic and very much so. And uh, still, I have the nostalgia, whatever it is. When did, what age did you leave? I left in 1950. And how old were you then? I was. How I was old? 17. Seven. Yeah. yeah. So thank you very much. Uh, 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 this is. This is really an important part of the story, uh, which I didn't get to, and that is, uh, I alluded to it when I mentioned that uh, anti-Semitism uh, was imported into the Arab Muslim world uh, during the colonial period in the 19th century uh, uh, by uh, Europeans, uh, European Christians, Catholics, uh, missionaries, and colonialists, and this caught on with uh, Arab Christians, uh, and uh, what you say there very much supports this sort of thing. Um, uh, the, uh, another piece of the story is that uh, a lot of the, uh, many of the uh, uh, highly educated Jewish intellectuals in, um, in Iraq uh, joined the Communist Party, as did the Shiites, who also were odd men out. Uh, the Jews uh, were a little bit worried about Iraqi nationalism, although many, many of them did, a, uh, did identify with Iraqi nationalism because nationalism always tends to focus in on who are the most deserving of being a member of that nation. And many Jews preferred communism because it was an international movement. Another move, question. The next question will be to our right. Yes, um, my question is, I know that ISIS today is a group that would rather follow the laws of the Quran rather than Western teachings that we have today in the Western Hemisphere. But would a, say, Hasidic Jew who would rather follow the teachings of the Torah rather than 
Western values, would they be possibly safer there than they would be in modern Western society, or just at least more welcomed? I'm not, I didn't hear the last part. Would, 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 would a Jew feel safer where? Or more, uh, better placed, or more welcomed in a more religious uh, Muslim no, society? Living, living, under, living under the rule of ISIS? Yeah. Uh, I, well, I doubt that very much. Uh, and that, for a simple reason. Uh, ISIS is not Islam. ISIS represents a deformation of Islam. Uh, it is not, uh, it is intolerant of everybody who is not identified with the ISIS ideology. ISIS is far less tolerant than Islam was in the Middle Ages. So while Jews living in Muslim lands in say Iraq in the 10th, 11th century were protected, uh, uh, ISIS uh, represents a deformation of Islam, an exaggeration of all that is evil to the exclusion of the toleration, toler tolerant features of Islam. So a Jew would not feel more comfortable living under Islam as defined, as defined by ISIS. Thank you. You're welcome. Over here. Yes, hello, my name is Ernesto. I have a question, and maybe my ignorance from my side. I know so much about the, the area. Uh, but if I'm not mistaken, the Quran talks about, specific about the Jews, what, who are they, how do they be treated, mm -hmm. and there's some specific statements. I don't, I don't know Arabic, so it's hard for me to mm -hmm. translate it directly. Yeah. I have to read it from translation to English, mm -hmm. and I guess there's a lot of variety, a lot of definitions about it. Mm -hmm. So that's one question about it. Right. And, and the other question is the, the deformation of society in Iraq uh, that they're pulling up. And as far as I know, uh, uh, that you have the, the different sections and within their own sections, Kurds, Shias, and, and, and Sunnis, all fighting for the peace of, peace of land. Uh, from your experience, from your point of view, from your, your experience, mm. just tell me what your own experience yeah. is. Yeah, uh, so you're asking, the first question is about the Quran. Uh, look, the Quran has some very unfriendly things to say about the Jews. It has uh, many unfriendly things to say about the Christians as well. Some of the statements uh, are very severe. Uh, that has a historical context because the Prophet Muhammad, uh, when he emigrated from Mecca, where he was persecuted by pagan Meccans, uh, to Medina, where he was uh, largely accepted by Arabs who followed him, uh, met up with a large population of Jews who lived there, only very few of whom followed his Islam, converted. And so great tag antagonism was built up between Muhammad and the Jews of Medina. That explains, I believe, uh, the negative statements about the Jews and Judaism that are found in the Quran. At the same time, the Quran shows a great debt to Judaism. You can pick up the Quran and read stories. Say the story of Joseph looks, looks very much like the story of Joseph in the Bible with certain accretions from the Midrash because Muhammad heard, heard these stories told by Jews and he was very interested in them. And many of the Islamic practices, excuse me, uh, such as fasting and daily prayer, come from Judaism. The idea of a Sabbath, and though the Muslim Sabbath isn't quite as strict as the Jewish Sabbath, nonetheless comes from the Jews. Uh, so uh, the Quran is a has a mixed measure, uh, an ambivalent uh, approach to the, the Jews. As far as uh, modern Iraq is concerned, and what we hear today about conflicts between the Shia and the Sunni, the Sunnis and the uh, Kurds, etc., um, th these conflicts have their seeds in the past. Uh, the, the conflict between Shia and Sunni is a, an ancient conflict that goes back as early as the seventh century, um, and uh, because the uh, Sunnis have tended to dominate the political scene, scene there to the exclusion of the Shia, there's a lot of uh, bad blood. 
between them. Uh, of course, it was, this was held in check by authoritarian Islamic Iraqi regimes. Saddam Hussein held it in check. And the American invasion of Iraq, of course, set loose a lot of the uh, uh, internecine conflicts that were seething underneath the surface before that time. So that's a, an unfortunate result of uh, American intervention. I know that there are still some more questions, but there may be some time afterward if you'd like to ask Dr. Cohen. I'd like you at this point in time to join me one more time in a round of applause, please, for Dr. Mark Cohen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please remember to complete your evaluations, which will be compiled by the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education. And we certainly appreciate your input. And MCHE appreciates your contact information for future programs. We look forward to seeing you at our next program. That is two weeks from now. Same time, same space. Drive safely and good night.